Hello, good morning. Yes. <laughs> the monitor's over there, so if you see me looking off into space, I'm just looking at your gorgeous faces. Um, good morning. Welcome to Sour Flower Studio. Um, you are seeing us go live. Us, uh, Shane is here running the cameras and um, moderating our Zoom for us this morning. We're in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and um, right next to a beautiful stone church and the bells just went off so we know it's time to start baking on saturday morning okay um if you're baking along with me that's great um you know you can jump in at any point i believe i said that in the email um we'll go through the whole process so if you made your dough last night and you've got it ready this morning you can keep it in the fridge until we start shaping it um, and if you want to mix the dough with me, go ahead and have those ingredients ready as well. So this morning I'm going to be talking about sourdough bagels. If you have questions, that's what I'm here for. Please type your questions into the chat box. Shane, who is our camera guy and a moderator, will ask those questions out loud for you. And uh, go ahead and put yourself on mute if you haven't already. And Let's get going, okay? So it would be inappropriate to talk about uh, bagels and not talk about um, the history of Jewish people. And so it is my understanding um, that the bagel evolved from a time in Eastern Europe and Poland where Jews were being persecuted and unable to bake their wheat-based breads. So they began boiling them. So the boiling and then the baking um, is where that comes from. And so the bagels, of course, came over. Um, I'm from New England, and so I'm familiar with the New York style bagel and the Montreal style bagel. Uh, Montreal bagel is going to be boiled with a little bit of honey in the water. It's generally going to have some egg in the dough, and it's certainly going to be baked in a wood-fired oven. So that's a, a signature trademark of the Montreal style bagel. And one of the aspects of baking a bagel in a wood-fired oven is something called a bagel board. So I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here, so stick with me. But um, if you would like to make your own bagel boards, we'll be baking our bagels with that kind of Montreal style aspect, but more New York style dough I'll get into in just a second. This is untreated cedar, just from Lowe's. You can use pine cedars better um, and just some um, craft burlap. So this is three and a half inches wide. Um, they will cut the lumber down for you at low. So again, this is untreated cedar and this is about 13, 14 inches to fit comfortably in your home oven. And you cover the board uh, with the burlap and you're going to staple gun it here and you have a gorgeous bagel board. Um, so I first started baking bagels with my friend Bex um who is an amazing baker and um really enlightened me on the subject of bagels and we would bake them in a wood-fired oven with these boards so i also use these in my home oven which you'll see later but definitely bagel boards are a signature trademark of the montreal style bagel in a wood-fired oven so essentially we'll, we'll soak the boards i'll show you that the bagel goes on it and the steam from the burlap keeps um, the top moist, and then we're going to flip it out onto either your wood fired surface or in the home oven, a pizza stone. So if you don't have these today, that's fine. You can bake it on a sheet pan, no problem. Um, also want to touch on our dough, however, is a little bit more of a New York style bagel. So chewier, bigger, a little bit more white flour, um, and that is my first experience with bagels as a, a young person was going to New York City for the first time, seeing you know a Broadway show and eating a bagel with lox, and it really just transformed my life. If anybody has a bagel memory that you want to share with us in the comments, please do. So we've got Montreal style New York. There are many different kinds, but today we are making sort of a hybrid, um, and we want to talk about the ingredients. We'll mix the dough um, and get going. So the ingredients for this sort of big, chewy, 
nice New York style bagel is going to be a high gluten bread flour. So flour has different levels of protein. If you're making a cake or a cookie, you want to have a softer flour, like a low protein flour. Maybe that's nine or 10% protein in that flour. So that actually you're not trapping gas in that dough. The gas can pass through the batter as it bakes and you get a, a nice feathery tender crumb. And then we are all the way on the other side of the spectrum over here in the pizza and bagels for Katcha Camp. We have a high protein, high gluten specific bread flour um, that's going to have like 14 to 16 percent protein. So that protein level in this flour allows us to have a lot of chew, a lot of tug, trap gas very well and just be very sturdy. Um, but it is important, um, unlike bread doughs, those of you who bake bread, we're just we're trying so hard to get the dough to rise. You don't want a huge open crumb in your bagel. At least I personally don't. I want something a little tighter. What that means if you're unfamiliar with the word crumb. When you slice your bagel and you look at the interior, I don't want it to look like a ciabatta or a baguette. I actually want it to be a little dense so you know it can hold whatever I'm gonna put on there. So um, we have a low hydration. So the water, so, uh, I'm going over the ingredients. High gluten bread flour. Um, the flour that I'm using today is from Central Milling. They're in Utah. And they're, this flour is called um, High Mountain Organic Bread Flour and 14-15% uh, protein. I can find Bob's Red Mills bread flour in my grocery store. Occasionally I can find King Arthur bread flour. Those are totally acceptable bread flours to use. However, I think this one is superior, so I do go through the effort of ordering it online. I'm very excited. I just saw Central Milling has now released five pounds and 25 pound bags. It used to just be a 50 pound bag, so that's a lot of bagels, but bagels are good, right? So um, Central Milling, and I forgot to note, um, I'll be milling just a small bit of spelt flour. So there's also, I always need to incorporate some amount of whole grain or flour flesh, fresh flour into my doughs. Uh, my history as a baker is working with uh, freshly milled organic flour in Asheville, North Carolina from Carolina Grounds. So if you're looking for a great source for fresh, strong ground flour, Carolina Grounds, Anson Mills, Farm and Sparrow, they're all accessible online. And even when I'm making something like a pizza or bagel, a focaccia, that is primarily a white flour with a high level of protein, I always like to add in something freshly ground. So um, we're gonna fresh mill some spelt flour here in just a minute, add it in, that will be our flour component. So that is, that is the flour. That whole grain is gonna give it some flavor, it's gonna give it some personality, um, and in terms of the differences in the flour itself, this white strong ground flour doesn't have any of the germ of the wheat berry and the germ is just a delicious fragrant aromatic oily um, part of the seed that i want in my flour so the white flour doesn't have it the freshly milled flour certainly will so you get a little creamier dough a little bit more personality and nutrients um, those are important i hear so flour ingredients um, water, tap water is fine to use. We're going to go over getting the um, temperature of the water in just a moment. And of course, start of the show, your sourdough starter. I generally keep a white flour sourdough starter, but this is, uh, I only had whole wheat flour at my house last night. So this is my starter here. It's a little past its peak, but you want to have a active bubbly sourdough starter to go into your dough. So I feed this about six to eight hours before I make my bagel dough, or you could feed it, you know, I go to bed around nine, no judgment. You can feed it, you know, in the evening, leave it on the countertop at room temperature. By room temperature, I mean somewhere between 68 and 70 degrees, and then mix your dough the next morning. Um, so it's bubbly, it smells good. You should, it should smell a little floral, a little yogurty, uh, have some bubbles, dish soap size bubbles on the top. If you wake up or for whatever reason you fed your starter and you come back to it 
and it's fizzy, it smells really pungent, it kind of smells like vinegar, go ahead and refresh your starter. Should be ready a couple of hours after that and then mix your bagel dough there. So sourdough starter, very important. Um, it's going to culture the dough. We've got yeast and lactobacilli in your sourdough starter. So wild yeast from the environment, from my body, from the flour, um, and then lactobacilli, uh, lactic acid bacteria, that's going to help transform the flour to make it more digestible. It's gonna pre-digest some of those simple sugars so your body doesn't get a huge sugar spike when you eat um, flour goods made with sourdough. And it's also gonna create that gorgeous flavor that we look for, a little, just a little bit of tang in our bagel. Um, other ingredients that we'll need down the road, we'll go over this real quick. This is a chef's kiss, the everything bagel topping, nothing better, put it on everything. Um, we've got poppy seeds, sesame seeds, uh, flaky salt, minced garlic, and uh, more sesame seeds here. And um, you can uh, adjust the level of ingredients if you like one of these more or another. This is just my everything bagel topping go-to, and I like to have it ready um, before I start. Of course, forgot in the dough, we're gonna want salt. So I use pink Himalayan sea salt for everything. It's got a nice minerality to it. Also, when I'm, I'm mixing a bread dough, if I give it a rest without the salt, I'll often put the salt on top and it's nice that it's a bit of a color so I can see if it's incorporated into the dough or not. Small detail, but for me over the years, it's made a big difference. So just pink Himalayan sea salt. And I think in terms of ingredients, that's it. So I'm gonna go ahead and freshly melt some spelt flour behind you. Um, I do have a couple different kinds of tabletop mills. This one here is the Como, K-O-M-O. -O, and um, I've had it for several years. It is my favorite. So inside the housing of this mill are two small stones. The grain will go down between the stones and they're gonna move like this. It's gonna crack it crush it and turn it into flour. So again, here, I don't know if you can see the beautiful spelt. So spelt is pretty much my favorite grain. I will find an excuse to put it in anything. It's very extensible. So what that means is, um, you know, you can stretch a dough without it tearing easily when you use spelt flour. It has a gorgeous, almost floral, honey-like flavor to it and it's nice and plump. It's also considered an ancient grain. It's within the family of einkorn, emmer, and spelt, and so it's just a nice way to remember our past as we go through this. So, I'm gonna turn it on. <laughs> That's good. So we only need 80, 80 grams of this, very little. Um, but it's so wonderful to be able to freshly mill flour at home the same way you would crack pepper over a salad before you eat it or freshly grind your coffee beans before you make your coffee. Flour is the same thing and um, it's wonderful when we can treat flour like a fresh ingredient. So here we are. Um, the high gluten, high protein flour is already in my mixing bowl here. And we are using a digital scale today. I'll go over the tools kind of as we use them, but um, this is a my way scale. It's what I use in all my workshops. I do prefer a digital scale that has a platform slightly raised. And um, digital scales are very important. We've seen the emergence of more home bakers using digital scales and it's wonderful for consistency. So we would certainly measure with um, a digital scale in a production environment. So it's consistent between bakers and day to day. 
we can embrace that in our own baking at home. So I've got my white flour already weighed in. The great thing about a scale also is less dishes. So I've got, um, I'm putting everything in the mixing bowl, uh, turning it, turning the scale on, putting the mixing bowl on, and then I'm gonna use the tear button. And you can add each ingredient into the dough and then just tear afterwards. So you don't have to do any extra math. And um, so I need 80 grams in here, bowls on, I'm gonna tear it and add my 80 grams. If you wanna experiment with other kinds of flour, like say this, this is 80% uh, high gluten bread flour and 20% something special. So if you want to experiment with a different kind of flour, use that 20% or this 80 grams to try something that you're curious about. Maybe it's not spelt flour, maybe it's something different. Um, I would recommend you stay away from something that doesn't have um, adequate gluten. So that would be rye flour and buckwheat flour. All right, so we're in. I'm gonna go ahead and add the salt. So we're at nine grams salt, add the salt in. Okay, and I'm gonna put it on the mixer and just stir the dry ingredients together with a dough hook. You could do it with your hand. I just prefer that. do it with a whisk, whatever works for you. And you should always, whether it's a, I guess I just get my hand in there because I can't help it. Whether it is a bagel dough, pizza dough, bread dough, focaccia dough, always aerate your flour. It just helps it accept the water and you'll have a, a nicer dough for it. So fluff it up, give it some love, All right? All the dry ingredients are combined. I'm gonna put it back on the scale. I'm going to add my delicious sourdough starter. I believe it's 106 grams. Uh, we do got two questions. <clears throat> okay, just a moment. We'll get to the questions in just a sec. We'll talk about the water. So if you are tuning in and you're like, this is a little different than what I did yesterday. I did make some adjustments to the recipe. I sent it right before the class started. So if this is not matching what you did, that's okay. I just find that a recipe is a living entity and is always open to improvement. And my goal with any recipe is to kind of help you <laughs> save time, cut some corners, understand what's essential, what's not, and then give you some clues as to you know where your dough is at. So if you are following the earlier recipe, that's okay. There is a new one in your inbox. So just to clarify any confusion. And the new one that I'm going off of this morning, it's new and improved. Um, there is no resting of the dough without the salt. Um, that's okay. And if you're like ready to take your baking to the next level, you absolutely can Mix all of these ingredients together, withhold the salt, add the salt in an hour later, that will make a stronger dough. But this is just one bowl this morning. All right, great, let's take some questions. Okay, one uh, did relate to uh, what you were talking about okay. just there. It was, uh, I saw your new updated recipe this morning. What if I used the first version and didn't start feed six to eight hours before? That's totally okay. Um, one thing I love about bagels is they seem difficult. It's actually so forgiving. This uh, dough has a low amount of water. It's in the fridge for a long period of time. So I find it really hard to go wrong. And you know, it's, there was not, it's not wrong if you did it the earlier way, but we're trying to always grow and improve here. At least I am. I don't know. I'm trying. So I've got a different version for you this morning. Okay. So sorry for any confusion. So uh, do we need a certain amount of water for that one tablespoon of barley, malt, and one uh, 
teaspoon of baking soda? Great question. So also on the new and improved recipe for you, I have pulled out the baking soda and the barley malt. It's its own little table underneath. And um, the baking soda and the barley malt are going to go in a giant pot of boiling water, not in your bagel dough. So again, sorry for any confusion. And if you didn't get this this morning for any reason, just let me know. I'll send it to you directly after class. The reality is there's a million different ways to skin a cat and you know we could write 20 different excellent bagel recipes. But working on the dough this week, I have a toddler now, as many of you know, and I myself was looking for a bit of a shortcut. And so I started making the dough without the hour pause, um, using my sourdough starter a little bit earlier, and then just getting clear on where everything goes. So the baking soda and the barley malt go into the water that we're going to boil the bagels in. So hopefully that clears it up for you. Um, actually, it was about how much water to boil in relation to the barley malt and soda. Um, I have a full five quart. I have a big stock pot, like um, this guy full of water. Yep. So I don't know, two, two pictures worth. Hopefully that helps. Okay, cool. Um, water temperature. So some bakers choose to talk about this, some don't. I think it's actually really important um, for the home baker. In a professional setting, when you mix your doughs, you'll have a water meter next to the mixing bowl. You'll take the temperature of your flour, the temperature of the room, the temperature of the pre-ferment, and you will use those temperatures with the total temperature factors, the overall temperature of your bread dough to calculate your water temperature. You're gonna plug that water temperature into the water meter and in a professional setting, it's just gonna feed the giant mixer the correct temperature water. That's how we get consistency in a production setting. Home bakers, right, our, our environments are hard to manage. Um, you know, maybe our kitchen is drafty, maybe where we bake is next to the wood stove. We have a lot of variables as a home baker when we set out to mix our bread dough. And just like cheese making, wine making, beer making, anything where you're fermenting, we do want our doughs to ferment within a certain temperature range. So for a wheat-based dough, which is what this is, we want it to ferment at around 76 degrees. Um, rye bread, for example, the flour is structurally very different. I'm like push, pushing the rye bread away. Rye flour, um, we want rye flour to ferment at say 82 degrees. So there are differences between flours in terms of fermentation. So this bagel dough, I want to be 76 degrees Fahrenheit when I'm done mixing it. So I'm gonna introduce you to something called desired dough temperature to help you figure out the temperature of your water. We've already calculated this and I've got the correct temperature water, which for me this morning was 58 degrees. And to do this activity, you need a calculator. If you, if you need a calculator, a pen, um, a digital thermometer, and I'm just actually going through what is in your materials on the second page under desired dough temperature. And if your eyes are already like, oh my God, this is too much information, you can come back to this when you're ready for it, if you need it in the future, water around like 70 degrees is probably fine. Um, so here's how it works. You've got your total temperature factor, your overall temperature. Then we're going to figure out the temperature of the room, the temperature of the flour, temperature of the starter. We're going to subtract those from the total temperature uh, factor. And that number that we get at the end is magically the temperature that we need for our water. So I did this about 10 minutes before class started. Um, so to get, if you're curious how we get that total temperature factor, it's a great question. Um, we want our dough to be 76 degrees and we've got four different factors going on. So we've got the ambient temperature of the room, the temperature of the flower, um, the temperature of our starter, wherever it has gone off to. And then we also have something called the friction factor. 
So the friction factor is the fourth temperature. And that's essentially the amount of heat that's added to the dough as you're mixing. So if you're mixing by hand, which you might be, um, that's gonna be a very uh, small amount of heat that you're generating in your dough there. And hand mixing is about 10 to 11 degrees of heat added into the dough. However, mixing in a mixer like my KitchenAid here is gonna heat your dough up maybe 30 to 35 degrees. So that's pretty significant. So let's say, you know, you start off making your bagel dough and the flour's been out overnight and it's warm in your house. You use warm water because you think you should use warm water. You mix it for 15 minutes in the mixer. Your dough might be 125 degrees when you're done mixing. And, you know, it's, that's like uh, one, if your dough is too hot, it will this is a living entity. It will start to kill off some of the great yeast microbes and bacteria that we want in this dough, but it's also going to ferment so quickly and overproof, over ferment, and just be really difficult to work with. On the opposite side of the spectrum, your doughs could also be too cold. Maybe you left a window open. Maybe you're using freshly milk flour and you're pulling it out from the freezer. So the opposite can happen too, and your dough comes out of the mixer at 50 degrees, and then you're waiting around all day for it. So this is just to help you get your dough in that perfect zone coming off the mixer, and uh, so it will ferment in the timetable that we're suggesting here in this recipe. So um, 76 times your four different factors equals 304 degrees Fahrenheit. When I did this earlier, so just turn on your, you know, digital, uh, thermometer. This is the kind I like to use. You can get, I think this is just a, a relatively inexpensive one that I got from the supermarket. You can find them at restaurant supply stores. You can get really expensive ones, which is like maybe a nice gift for yourself or someone you know who loves to bake. These will help you so much. So um, just turned it on, temperature of the room was 70 degrees. The flour was also sitting here um, over the course of the evening, so it's generally going to be the same. Stick it in the flour, take the temperature of the flour. You feel very sciencey here. Um, just make sure you're not touching the bowl or the container. So it was uh, 72 degrees temperature of the flour and your starter. So I have found where my starter carried off to. I'm going to take the temperature of the flour. It's like the fork and the spoon running away together. The sourdough and the salt, we're having a thing. Okay, great. A little cooler, 68 degrees, so that's gonna make a difference. And then as I mentioned earlier, the friction factor, so the amount of heat that's added to the dough from the mixer is 30 to 35 degrees. So I subtract each of those from the total temperature factor of 304 and I get 58. That number that you get is the temperature your water needs to be. So turn on my faucets, calibrate them. You can get your, um, get the water flowing, stick your digital thermometer in. Once it's the right temperature water, fill up your pitcher and you're good to go. We'll take the temperature of the dough once it comes off the mixer. So hopefully this is just a quick introduction to get you thinking about the temperature of your dough, because that's gonna set you up for success. You don't want it to be too hot. You don't want it to be too cold. We want it to be 76 degrees when we're done mixing all the ingredients here. Um, before I do that, do we have any questions about the desired dough temperature and how to get it? Um, wouldn't it all be the same temp if left out on the, uh, on the counter overnight? Yes, but not everything is always left out on the counter. For example, my starter was moving along quickly. So I actually had it in the fridge for a couple of hours. Um, freshly milled flour might be warmer coming off the mill than flour from a bag. If you're using freshly uh, milled flour, generally you're going to have that in your freezer. So you might not have a flour that is um, room temperature. And just fluctuations in the season, to be quite honest, I 
you know, I'll practice this for a while and then I'll start to notice, oh, okay, pretty much every morning, my water temperature is around 72 degrees. But then you get a cold snap, right? We're going through something here um, in our region called Blackberry Winter. It was like 80 degrees and we were sticking in the AC to the window. And then today it's like we're wearing sweaters and it's raining and, and super cold out. So uh, environmental changes happen and this just helps you eliminate the variables. You are correct if everything is on the countertop then it will all be that same, you know, degree, but you still want to get your water temperature. Okay. So I'm adding in the water. This is a very stiff dough. So when I say that this is a 50% hydration, um, all bread formulas are written with the flour as a hundred percent. And then everything else is expressed as a, uh, relationship and ratio to that 100%. So this is 50% water. So it's 212 grams water going into the bowl of 68 degree water. Okay. So it's gonna be nice and tight and dense. The more water you have in a dough, the more open it will be. So this can be a nice tight crumb for all of our schmears. And you want to start with it on low so it doesn't kick everything back at you. We call that getting ghosted when you get um, covered with white flour or powdered sugar. Okay, so it's looking good. It's, uh, it's just starting to come together. So I'm going to turn it up. And this dough is stiff, so it will work your tabletop mixers. So I usually just press down on the top and it's getting really shaggy, so that's good. So take a minute with the dough up here. Oh, it smells already so good. So I'm gonna show you the dough about halfway through. So super stiff, right, but it's also really shaggy and there's a bit of dry flour in the bottom of the bowl. So I'm going to turn the mixer back on and I'm just going to drizzle the smallest amount of water into the bowl to get it um, the right consistency. What we're looking for is all those dry bits of flour to be absorbed into one nice dough ball. It generally will climb up the hook, pull away from the sides, and um, still be pretty tight and dense. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back on low and just drizzle. Use restraint. A little goes a long way here. Okay, I'm gonna turn up the speed. Drizzle. Little bit more. This is really just to get, this is like a teaspoon I just put in there, just to get the bits uh, on the bottom out. Okay, so it doesn't need any more water. It was probably only a, a tablespoon total that I added. So I've got my dough. There's nothing left in the bowl, no dry bits of flour, but I can see that obviously some portions are what I call scaly, like there's a little bit of um, chunks of flour and it's not quite smooth and consistent yet. So I'm gonna put this back in. And the nice thing about having a pitcher of water around, I do this in all of my baking, is it's, this might be a minor thing, but it really saves me from gumming up my sink with all kinds of dough. And wow. 16 degrees is chilly. <laughs> and pick it up a notch for a minute. Someone was asking about mixing dough by hand. 
Sure. I'll get to that in just a sec. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you'll see, it, it's like very dense. Climbs up the hook. You're going to just wrestle it off. getting our burner on here for the boiling of the bagels. Okay, so this is my bagel dough. Going to sprinkle a little bit of uh, flour on there, knead it into a ball, and then we're gonna transfer it to an air airtight container. Okay, so to knead it, um, I'm essentially doing this motion. I like to fold it over, get a little bit of flour on the outside. And if you are a bread baker, uh, you may know that there are trends in baking. And we've seen, you know, I feel like in the past five or six years, we've all become really obsessed with putting a lot of water into our bread dough. And that means that we have to do different folding and strengthening techniques. And I love this bagel dough because we actually get to knead it. <laughs> and um, that's not something I get to do with a lot of my bread doughs. They're wet and sticky and I sort of slap them around. This is just very soothing to my person. Okay, so knead it into a nice little ball, cover it with a little bit of flour, and here is your bagel dough. Started to tear a little bit here, that's okay. Could have held back. Essentially, you want just a nice, stiff, smooth ball of dough. If you are doing this by hand, um, that's totally great. You might wanna turn your dough out at a, at a certain point. Um, if you're doing it by hand, put everything into your mixing bowl. I call this the claw hand. You wanna get your claw hands in there, you're gonna stir everything together. Once that flour starts to moisten and take on a little bit of that water, you may want to, because it's so stiff, um, instead of just squeezing it through your fingers with this kind of motion, you may want to turn the dough out onto the table and just go ahead and knead it into a ball to finish off your mixing from your bowl. In either scenario, you want to go ahead and take the temperature of your dough once you are done mixing. So with your desired dough temperature, you can see, oh, it just shut off, but I promise it was 75. <laughs> so 75.6, so we're right on target um, with our dough here. So whether it's coming out of the mixer or uh, you mixed it by hand and you're ready to put it in your um, container for rise, the first rise, first bulk fermentation, you want it to be about 76 degrees. And what's interesting to me is I've been baking almost every day for 20 years, and I'm still shocked when I go to take my water temperature, like, wow, I, I thought maybe I knew what 70 degrees is, but I've actually been using 85 degree water in my doughs, and that's maybe why they're a little bit off. So just helps you narrow in the focus. It's a beautiful bagel dough, and you'll put it in, um, you can, Use a large mixing bowl with a dinner plate for a lid, not technical at all. You can also invest in a couple containers for dough. This is a Cambro, um, two quart, this perfect size for the bagel dough, and they have these nice tight lids. So this dough was mixed this morning and it's been out for two hours. And you can see it's pretty stiff, um, but it has, basically doubled. And when I press on it, I certainly feel some gas. So in your container, whichever kind of container you prefer, it's a personal choice, cover it so it doesn't dry out from any airflow. Um, and if you took your temperature of your dough and it was a little hot, just put it in a cool location for the next hour. If you took the temperature of your dough and we were like, whoa, this dough is really cold. Just stick it somewhere warm for the next hour. 
one hour into your first rise, or what we will also call bulk fermentation in baker speak, you want to turn it out onto the table and knead it just like I did here. And then we're transfer it back into the container, lid on, and then one hour after that into your fridge. And it can live in the fridge anywhere from you know four hours to 24 hours. So essentially putting it in the fridge, it's gonna slow down the fermentation. So slow down the um, production of gas, but it's also going to help flavor the dough as well. So you're getting a lot of culturing going on in the fridge, the slowing down of the gas production, because again, we don't want like a huge open crumb in our bagel dough. Okay. So the next day, today for me, you're gonna take your dough out of the fridge, shape it, proof it, boil it, and bake it. So let's just go from the beginning here. Uh, day prep, you know, prep out your starter, feed your starter, get it out, give it some love, refresh it, discard most of it, fresh flour and water. It's a refreshment of your starter. Let that um, come to life six to eight hours. Maybe you want to prepare your bagel toppings. Um, and then you will mix your dough together. The dough is going to be out for two hours. You're going to knead it an hour into that first rise and then pop it in the fridge. The next day, you're ready for the second phase of the process. Uh, pizza dough, I find, is great for up to three days in the fridge, but we do want less gas production in our bagel dough. So I don't recommend keeping it in the fridge for over 24 hours, but life happens. And if you forget about it or something comes up, you know, you can use it 48 hours later too. It's nice and controlled inside of your refrigerator. Okay. Someone asked if they, uh, they just made the dough and they're wondering if they can shape, et cetera, uh, tonight, or is it better just leave it tomorrow? I would leave it till tomorrow. Complete truth, reality here. You can kind of do whatever you want, honestly. So if that works best for you, I'm gonna go grab something to show everybody real quick. Be right back. I forgot to have one of these out, but um, you can do this two ways. I try not to give folks too many options because I know for myself, like I've kind of functioned best when I have a, a limited amount to choose from. So if this is gonna get confusing for you, just bear with us for a minute. You can make your bagel dough just like we did, two hours, so when you would put it in the fridge, you can choose to shape the bagels then. So if you wanna have them proofing, and you just wanna start off boiling the next day, that's okay, and if you wanna do it that way, um, I recommend one of these. This is a pizza box, and it fits in your fridge nicely. You can even go like under the cheese drawer, and um, what I would do is, after the two hours, turn the dough out, shape your bagels, and then you can put them in the box a um, couple inches apart. You're gonna put the lid on, stick it in your fridge, and then they will slowly proof. They will only proof in your fridge, and um, you take them out the next morning and go ahead and boil them then. So that's a, a small tangent, but those are two, you know, two different options that we're working with here. So um, I purchased these online from a website called Websterant, and I don't know. Hide your credit card. It's like industrial baking goods for anybody. So they get delivered right to your home door. And um, for pizza parties, pizza dough, bagels, these things are totally magic. Um, this is a great time for questions. Do you have any questions? I'm gonna ask if I can put that in the chat. What was the, what was the main point in that? Um, you can, yeah, and feel free to email me. I love to keep in touch with people after this, but um, essentially you have two choices. You've made your dough. It's a wonderful 75, 76 degrees. 
You're gonna ferment it for two hours. After that two hour mark, you can shape your bagels, put them in a proofing box and proof them in the fridge overnight, boil them the next day. Or you can uh, just put the whole dough in the fridge, pull it out, shape them and proof them at room temperature the next day. That's what we're doing here in the class. That's how I like to do it, but that's just me. I do find that sometimes I can overproof my shaped bagels and that's just, that's just me, but um, this is how I prefer to do it. So those are your two options. And if it's not clear in the chat, just let me know. Essentially, after the two hour mark, shape them and put them in the fridge or just put the whole dough in the fridge, shape them the next day. Okay, great. So we're gonna shape our bagels. We're getting six out of this. The original recipe was 24, which was just a lot for me to eat of bagels, but uh, I definitely after you make your bagels, totally cool to eat like three. You just have to actually, it's just how it goes. It's not, uh, no judgment. Homemade bagels are awesome. Okay, so I'm going to uh, show you how to shape them, but let me just clear up this area just for a moment. So it's so organized when I start and then it's like a bomb goes off. All right, get our calculator out here. I was a theater kid in high school, big surprise. And uh, I always feel like we need the, the lights to go black and everybody with their black turtlenecks to like come out and rearrange the set. Okay. Do so you want a little bit of flour to dust your work surface? If you wanna be super relaxed about it, you can just eyeball your bagel dough, but um, I'm going to choose to use the scale. So tiniest bit of flour. One of the perks of a very stiff dough is that it doesn't need a lot of flour. Um, doesn't tend to stick to anything. And your containers also stay really clean. So Beautiful. So I can already see some nice like webbing and fermentation. It feels like a pillow and uh, good to go. So I'm going to first eyeball it and you'll want something called a bench knife. So nice wooden handle, sturdy. I'm going to make already on here even before I use the scale, a bit of a grid just to help myself. Obviously it's a circle, so the middle portions are going to be denser than the ends. So I'm gonna account for that. Cut it down the middle and just make these end pieces kind of big triangles. And then these middle pieces, these I know are gonna be heftier and they're more like a rectangle, and then we've got our other end pieces. So the scale's just gonna check my work. So you put your piece of dough onto the scale and then you use your bench knife to adjust. So this is 129 grams. We're looking for 128 grams. I'm gonna just call this good. It is better for the shaping of your bagels to have one piece of dough rather than, this is also 129, um, a bunch of small bits of dough. This one's a little heavy, so I'm gonna remove it. I know that one's gonna be small, boom. And if you do this enough, you know, your hand will actually be able to calibrate and guide you. And if you're struggling and you've got, you know, a bagel that's like four different chunks of dough, that's, that's also fine. You'll learn as you go. So just taking a little bit off to make this one the right. So if you've got a couple portions of dough here, you're just going to seal it inside. All right, great. So we've portioned out our dough. And you really don't want 
much or any flour in your work surface. These are great for dividing your dough and also, of course, cleaning your area. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just fold each of these over and make a, like a little sausage shape, a little rope. So just simply folding it over, a little bit of a wind up, one, two, This dough feels very sculptural, and um, we are going to shape our bagels into ropes or snakes and uh, get them together. That way, there is a style of shaping bagels where you essentially roll the dough into a round and then poke in the middle and do this to wind the circle. I don't prefer that. They do look more like a button. Um, but we're doing this more like a baguette. So you've got your portions of dough and clean work surface. You've got a seam underneath and you're looking at the top. And you wanna start with your hands over each other like this. So my hands are over each other and you wanna keep in motion the whole time. So one hand's here, one hand's here, and I'm rolling it, I'm attempting to keep the seam underneath it and then I'm gonna start working my hands out. And then to finish it off, I'm moving my hands in this kind of direction. So take a minute and look, okay, obviously here and here are pretty different. You want a tapered end on each side, so I'm just gonna focus there to get that out. Okay, hands over the middle, going out, and then doing this nice sweep. to get kind of a point. I'm gonna take my hands, it's gonna go over thick part, oh, thick part on the outside, um, and the tails are going to crisscross. So, got that. And then using the table to help you seal. And then you can kind of adjust So you've got your, your bagel. You might have an end that sticks out. That's okay. Essentially, you want it to be what we're looking for is uniformity. But we're human, so that's just what we're looking for. That's not whatever actually happens. <laughs> the pursuit of perfection is worthwhile, but uh, enjoying reality in the present moment is also pretty important. Okay, so crossing over. And I'm really just applying pressure right there to get them to sort of kiss and stick together. And then I'm going all the way around the outside of the bagel. Okay. And uh, the Montreal style bagels are much thinner and more like a, a giant uh, oblong shape than a circle. And you can really get into watching some of this stuff on YouTube. Um, big bagel bakeries will often have just a, a portion of dough here that they're chopping up and someone is literally chopping it and shaping it as they go, which is so beautiful and inspiring. I mostly bake at home now, but I did work in production settings for a decade and I have such an appreciation for the mechanics and beauty of production. But gosh, I'm glad I'm not making 3,000 loaves of bread a day. <laughs> okay, so again, hands, hands, doing a nice, get it moving, make sure it's moving, and you're going outwards, and you're going this way. And if you feel like I can feel a giant a pocket of gas here. I don't want that to be a massive hole, so you can go ahead and pop it. And then cross and cross. So the key here is, you know, not, not like this, but more touch, more touching. And 
Last one. Here and here. If you are a lover of bialis, like I am, it's a very similar dough. You can make a, a bialy um, by uh, shaping your bagel dough into a round. You make a little um, indent in the middle. You can put your um, freshly chopped onions and poppy seeds and olive oil in the middle. So bialis, that's a whole other adventure, but oh, so good. Okay. So these are the shaped bagels. Do we have any questions about shaping your bagels? Anybody shaping along with me and encounter some difficulties, questions? All right, so here we have a tray of proofed bagels. We talked so much about temperature um, in the beginning, and temperature is important to your baking all the way through. So it's warm in this space. The oven's been on. We've got a massive pot of boiling water here. It's hot and steamy. So these bagels only took an hour to proof. Um, I'm going to dip my finger in a little bit of flour and do something called the poke test. I'm just poking the bagel to see the spring. And um, these look lofty. They, I can feel, you know, sometimes it's better to even just close your eyes. I can kind of feel, uh, you know, soft and supple and filled with air. And so as I poke it, I'm looking to see how quickly it springs back at me. This is holding the indent of my finger, but it still has some elasticity to it. So we're good. Uh, somebody was asking, how long do you proof your shape bagels for? Great. Would you mind? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, so proofing is going to be temperature dependent. I generally recommend two hours. That should be fine. Today, it was hot in the studio when I came in. So we turned off the AC overnight, but then I turned on the oven, had a boiling water, and wow, it got hot in here really fast. So these only proofed for an hour, and then I just transferred them to the fridge to hold off. It's going to slow the proofing down so we could boil and bake them together today. So um, that is an option to always use your refrigerator to slow things down. In general, at room temperature, 60 to 70 degrees, it should take about two hours. Uh, any tips uh, if you are doing these at, uh, I guess, a different altitude? I don't have much experience with high altitude baking. Um, in terms of proofing, I would still just go by the poke test. It's sort of the official, unofficial way to proof your bread, whether it's um, a bagel, a loaf of bread, bialy. So I'm sorry if anybody else has some comments that they want to leave for high altitude baking. I'm really not quite sure. And what temp do you consider hot and cold? Oh, right. Um, cold would be like 58, 62 degree kitchen. That's like what my kitchen is um, at home. It's like separate from the rest of the house and doesn't get a lot of the heat. So in the winter, my kitchen's really cold. So stuff proofs very slow. Um, hot, I'd say like, you know, 80, 85. That's when you kind of have to be on your toes because things might be moving quicker than you even want them to. Uh, we are using sourdough as not only a form of leavening, but also culturing, transforming, and flavoring the flour. So um, we want to give it time. The whole purpose of sourdough is slow, and um, you know, really pulling all of the flavor and nutrition out of the grain, out of the flour. So we don't want it to be too rushed. So while it can be exciting for things to move fast, it can move too fast. So hot to me is like 80, 85. 
Um, at that point, you know, you want to maybe consider where you're going to proof your dough. You might want to proof it in a cold uh, place like the fridge itself. All right, cool. I'm going to put the uh, shaped bagels onto their own little tray here. This is how you become a small bagel business. <laughs> and, uh, Um, while you are, so these are the ones I just shaped, while the dough is proofing, you do want it to stay moist. Um, and so you can spritz it with a little bit of water. You want to keep it covered. So I use just these very simple flour sack towels. You just don't want anything that has terry cloth because it'll stick to the dough. One, two. Cover these guys. You know, that always makes a nice little Instagram picture. Um, and let them prove we'll do these late. I'll finish these uh, later this afternoon. Okay, so for the steaming part now, we're gonna go through the process of boiling, topping, and baking, and this is the part I love the most. So, um, Shane, can we brief pause for moving some equipment? Could mm -hmm. you move this mixer just onto that table so we have it out of our seat? Are we completely done? We're completely done. Thank you, Shane. And thank you for joining me. This is so fun. Mm -hmm. um, if you're having a good time, you can take more of my virtual classes. We're pretty much doing the most uh, weekends throughout the summer. I do have a virtual wood-fired baking class and a whole virtual bread camp. So if you want to improve your bread game. And you can also come visit me here in beautiful Whitesburg, Kentucky at my studio and take a bread class, pie class, pizza class with me here. So you're set up for the rest of your bagel game. You want your boiling water and baking soda. And um, the recipe says barley malt, but we are here in the South Appalachia and um, sorghum is what I have on hand. This is just going to add a little bit of flavor, a little bit of sweetness, a little shine to your bagel using some kind of sweetener. So you can use any kind of regional sweetener. Um, honey is traditional for a Montreal style. And then this baking soda, we're gonna do like sixth grade science experiment. It's gonna give us a nice bloom in our boiling water. This is going to help crispen um, the crust of your bagel, similar to how a pretzel gets dipped in lye. Just gonna help you get a nice crisp outer coating um, the acidity is going to react with the dough and help that happen. So I've got proofed bagels. You really want to set up a production line for yourself. Proofed bagels, boiling water. You want a drainage board. So this is just a sheet pan with a wire wrap over it. I've got my oven on to uh, 475. I've got a pizza stone in my oven ready to go. And then Shane, I don't know if you can pan the camera mm -hmm. this way. We have our weeding bagel boards. So very important that you soak the bagel boards in water. So don't make your home oven a wood-fired oven. But um, soak both sides thoroughly for about five minutes before you start. So this is just a sheet pan. Um, it's half covered in water, again, soaking the bagel boards. So they will help steam the bagels as you go. Um, I don't prefer to use oven mitts. If you've seen me in a class before, you know that I love my welding gloves. So these are leftover from using a wood fired oven, but I bring them into my kitchen because I think they're superior to an oven mitt. It's just my personal opinion. The brand here is Hobart. But um, these are just really helpful for managing um, your bagel boards. And if you don't have a bagel board, totally cool. You can do the same thing. 
You're going to set up your production flow, and at the end, you'll just have a sheet pan with some parchment on it. Good to go. Okay. And you've got your toppings, whatever kind of toppings you want, already in their bowl. I'm now going to add to the boiling water my teaspoon of baking soda. So fun. A little blue. And my tablespoon of, I'm using sorghum here. This is so fun. Last week we did croissants and everything was ice cold. We were freezing. We had all the AC on, all the fans on. Today, Memorial Day weekend, we're getting hot and steamy, but now it's cold outside. So it is what it is. And then you're going to take your bagel, um, lower it in. You can do a couple at a time. And what you want to see, it's very important, you want to see it drop to the bottom and then rise to the top. That means that it's not overproofed. So I have two different doughs here. We'll kind of see how they go. You're going to boil one side about 90 seconds, and then turn it to the other side. So I have one of these. Uh, you can use a fish spat spatula with a long leg. Of course, you know, it will slow down the boil if your bagels are cold, but these are looking good. If your bagel just goes right to the bottom of the pot, doesn't ever come back up, it's probably underproofed, not a lot of gas in there. If it just stays directly on the surface um, and never does a little dip and comes up, you know, it's probably fine, but it might be overproofed. So again, our goal here is to proof them just so that we, when we dip them in the water, they touch the bottom and then quickly rise to the top. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip them now so we get both sides. And this is just going to help create that nice chewy exterior. Any questions about boiling or the setup here for your bagels? Everybody seems to be good. Uh, what if you don't have any parchment for your sheet pan? Uh, do you, uh, maybe a maybe a cast iron skillet. So I I wouldn't it, cornmeal. You just you want something on there so the bagel has a bit of lift from the pan. So maybe dust it with some cornmeal. Um, if if I were you, I would actually then maybe just bake them directly on the pizza stone. If you have a pizza stone, or directly bake them in a large cast iron skillet, just something um, a little different than the metal of the sheet pan, like a cast iron would do you better if it has to be naked underneath. All right, these are good, so you're gonna pull them out, and you wanna let them drain. Oh my God, already getting so excited. <laughs> it's really silly, but um, I just love bagels, and in part because of my friend who taught me the art of making bagels, um, you know, one of the things I get to do when I make bagels is think about them and um, all the great times that we've had and it really just makes me so happy. Okay. So this is a slightly different dough just to note these are taking longer to rise to the top. So two different doughs going on here. Um, and these, these are probably a little over. Those are probably a little under and Moving on. Okay, so as soon as you can bear to touch the bagel, I'm gonna get your board ready, your toppings. And I like I like to do both sides. It's just me. I do both sides, get the edges. And then one of these sides is going to be the top. And so the, the side that has a little bit more of a dome to it, right? They've been proofing on a flat surface. So the flatter portion is the bottom, the domed portion is the top. You want to put the dome down. So top, I do the bottom, I don't know, yellow. 
and we'll do the third. Just set to me. Oh, sorry, sorry. We want to get you a close up of the bagel topping. Oh, I got it. <laughs> just in case you didn't have your, you know, coffee, you're not quite awake. We're just. You're getting the real live experience here. Gorgeous. So they're on the board, ready to go. And I'm not sure, you might be able to pick it up, but just so that mm -hmm. folks can see it going into the oven. So in my oven, I have a range. The pizza stone is on, uh, it's a little dark over here, but the pizza stone's on one half. I've got one half open here. I don't really need the glove for this, but you're going to put your bagels in. On that half. Close the door. Uh, about 10 minutes, we'll check. And then these guys are ready to go. You just get a nice little flow going on. This is the part where it's great to like have some good music on. Just really get into it. If you're doing a lot of bagels, you, you will need to refresh your water after a certain point. Uh, so somebody asked, um, so the boil is not wildly boi boiling, just a gentle boil, it seems? Yes, gentle boil, gentle boil, yeah. And then somebody asked, is it top down or top up? In the water, it, it's both, so you flip it halfway through. You, you boil both sides. Sometimes they flip themselves, but generally I take, so the bagel, this is the bottom, this is the top. I generally take it and put it in top down first. Let it go for 90 seconds, turn it over, then you transfer it to the tray, then again, top down and top down onto the board. Oh, that was on the board, I'm sorry. Oh, so my apologies, yeah, um, top down on the board. Yep. Okay, so we'll do these guys. Do some playing. Um, my friend Bex, again, who, uh, taught me the art of bagel, we made a lot of bagels together. We'd take them to parties and we'd survey like, you know, what got eaten. And um, no doubt everything bagels were the top winner, but uh, we always made some sesame and some plain as well. It was so great to have that everything topping on hand because um, you can really, we put it on croissants, you can put it on anything, really. It's just delicious to get in a salad. These are looking good. I took a great class from Kristen Smith of the Wrigley Tap Room in Corbin, Kentucky on uh, dumplings and she was here yesterday um, and watching me boil the bagels and we had a whole great conversation about uh, dumplings and you know what kind of dumpling you prefer and how how do you like it to be steamed and how much and there's just so much in food that relates and connects us it's so fun so once I see um, a bit of color, then I will go ahead and flip them onto the pizza stone. They're going to finish on the pizza stone. And we're going to end up with Oops. super steamy. <laughs> uh, some really nice chewy bagels. You do want to eat your bagels the day that you make them. Um, they will. Um, Harden over time. I don't like to use the word stale because everything can be refreshed. But um, you do want to go ahead and eat your bagels the same day you boil and bake them. And if you can't, for whatever reason, 
go ahead and freeze them. Our final round. So you're gonna see the bagels as you boil them. You know they're gonna get that kind of dumpling look to the outside, nice and steamed and cooked. You will see them pop a little bit more in the oven too. So we're looking for a little bit more rise, which is why it's important to um, watch the proofing of your bagels. You still want them to have some energy to have a little oven spring by the time they get into the oven. So you can, you can underproof, correctly proof, or overproof your bagels. If I had to choose one, um, it would be to perfectly proof. But no, I would probably rather underproof uh, my bagels than overproof. You'll end up with a, a flatter bagel if they are overproofed. So I think for the sake of time, we'll just speed this up. I'll go ahead and show you. I don't know if she needs any closer, but I'm gonna flip the Let's see. bagels out onto the stone. We'll make it happen. That is about as far as I can get. What does it look yeah, like? Right. So when you're flipping it, it's really like it's a flick of the wrist, almost like you're making a pancake. So if this is you know, obviously it's hot, so just embrace it. We're baking, it's getting warm over here. Hot pizza stone, hot board, welding glove. I'm gonna pick it up like that, so my hands underneath it, and then you're just going to turn them out. Ta -da! And then you can put your next board in. Oh, it smells so good. Okay. Hey, we have any questions here? We've got uh, about 10 more minutes on the bagels there. I'm gonna just put this boiling water over here. <laughs> Is, let's see, there's a few questions. Um, let me just make sure. Um, okay, uh, if using sheet pans, still top down or top up? Top up on the sheet pan. And does it matter what the ratio is of seeds and garlic, just what you prefer? It is what you prefer, yes. So it's been a hot topic on many a, a drunken baker's evening of exactly what you like to put in your everything bagel topping. But yeah, I, I prefer it a little saltier. Again, you want to use like a chunky salt, like a pretzel salt or um, a Malden salt and uh, lots of garlic. So you know, when I, I make them for my husband, I make sure to put a ton of garlic on there. But yeah, it, it really is just what you prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, tips in general on using a sheet pan. You're gonna, you do wanna have a, something lined on your sheet pan. And you can still flip them if you want, um, you know, about probably eight, 10 minutes in just as is. And if you, you know, wanna go ahead and flip them, you can. Um, so just because you're using a, a sheet pan doesn't mean you can't flip them. But in general, if I'm just using my sheet pan and not a bagel board like this, I'll just bake them on the sheet pan for that full amount of time on the parchment, you should be fine. So the follow-up question to that is like, so you don't ever flip the bagel when using the sheet pan? You or can or you cannot. It really is up to you. Um, I don't find too big of a difference if I'm just using the sheet pan. So personally, I just put them on the parchment line sheet pan, bake them for the 20, 25 minutes, remove them, put them on a wire rack to cool. It's simple, easy way to go. 
Okay. Someone was asking about your pizza stone. It's a uh, four-sided, not a rounded. Yeah, actually, um, the pizza stone that we have here is what I use on my grill to do outdoor pizza. It's from Lodge, which I'm sure many of you know um, is a great cast ironware cooking company. Skillets, bread pans, everything they make out of cast iron. So it's a very thin sheet of cast iron. I use it in my home oven for bagels, pizza, that kind of thing. I also use it on my grill to make a, a grilled top pizza. But yes, it is, uh, I'm calling it a pizza stone. It's actually not like a circular clay hearthstone, if that's what you're looking for. Um, other bakers, you might do something like, you can get clay tile from the hardware store. Maybe you're gonna line a deck of your, a rack, excuse me, of your oven with the clay towel. Use, you can use that the same way. You're just recreating a, a hearth inside your oven. Someone's asking if you can save overproof bread, like it got left out overnight and not in the fridge. Yes, uh, I always tell people, go ahead and make a focaccia. So get a little, you can get a little circular cast iron skillet or sheet pan, put some olive oil on it, turn out your overproofed dough into whichever vessel you're gonna bake it in, um, dimple it, so you know, walk your fingers through it, creating nice, bubbly surface, more olive oil, salt, bake it, I don't know, 500, 25, 30 minutes, and people will be asking you for that recipe. So always finish what you've started, and if you have overproofed your dough for whatever reason, um, continue with it. And proofing, truth be told, is one of the hardest aspects to figure out on your own. So have a lucky background of tons of production experience, and I remember my first baker job, you know, they, were, they said go over and proof the bread. And I was like, I mean, like hay bale rolling down the street. I had no idea what they were talking about. And they actually trained me with a blindfold on, it's like a very intense environment and you would just touch it. And so, you know, sometimes I do find um, that the home baker is at a disadvantage because you just don't have that sheer volume of practice. So go ahead and get a job in a bakery. Just kidding, or maybe not. But you're gonna have to do it a lot to get the hang of it. And I find that in general, folks baking a home tend to underproof. So you may think it's overproofed. I'm not trying to say you're wrong, but finish what you start because you're gonna learn something important every step of the way. And that bread that you thought was overproofed maybe isn't. Um, you can really push your bread dough. To tell if your bread is overproofed, if you press in on it and it literally flattens, then we're in the territory of overproofed. If it looks like poofy and billowy, maybe has some bubbles on the surface, you press in and it holds the indent of your fingers, you still might be in the zone, right? You've got underproofed, correctly proofed, and overproofed. So this is a whole spectrum. You might just be at the tail end of a correct proofing, is maybe my guess. Go ahead, turn it out into a sheet pan, cast iron skillet, cover it in olive oil, put some salt on it, and you're going to be like loving it as you eat it. Okay, uh, somebody has a pizza stone but no bagel board. So start cooking on a, a sheet pan and then flip to a pizza stone, question mark. Love it, yes. Uh, you could do that. Uh, the point of the bagel board is this burlap is releasing steam it's releasing a little bit of moisture to that surface of the bagel so it can continue to rise so it doesn't harden that's the point but you know yeah i mean this is what i love it really brings out people's creativity so if you don't have a bagel board on hand look around your kitchen um you know maybe you could like wrap a damp cloth around something and line it with that and turn them onto the pizza stump of course not trying to get anybody to like turn their home oven into a wood-fired oven by lighting something on fire in there. But uh, really the possibilities are endless if you just understand what the desired goal is. And the goal here is to just steam the um, top while the bottom bakes, and then you're gonna turn it on to the pizza stone so that the top finishes off, the bottom gets nice and crusty. I think our bagels are almost done, so let's just check.
uh, can you use a uh, ceramic pizza, pizza stones? Is that okay? Yes. Alright, I'm going to flip another board over. Okay. And our last board is going in. Woo! Good times. So we're going to get steamy. We are. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, somebody was wanting to know what, what the type of meal you used was. Sure. Um, it's a Como, K-O-M-O, -O, and um, they're German-made, really high quality. These are at the topper end of a uh, top tier of home mills, tabletop mills that you can get. I do also have, here I can show you, um, Excuse my departure. Um, this is a mock mill. This is also made in Germany, but it's a little bit nicer price point. The casing is um, recycled materials, and um, you know you can. There's whole little micro bakeries that run off of these. I generally use my tabletop mills to add a small percentage of fresh flour to my bread doughs. Um, they do heat up your flour. Um, so right inside here, we just have these two little stones. So the flour is really hot coming out. And if I were to make, say, a bread dough or a bagel dough using 100% freshly milled stone bread flour that I milled at home on one of these, um, then of course you can see why something like your desired dough temperature might be really important because that flour is going to be quite warm. So again, the one we use during class today is the Como. This is Honestly, the same uh, mechanics, but a little bit better price point. If you're not sure you're going to use it all the time, this is a mock mill. They're both great. Uh, somebody was asking, uh, Caroline was asking, uh, what's the name of the cast iron cookware company that you use? It's Lodge, uh, like, like the cabin, um, L-O-D-G-E, I think. Lodge cast iron. So, um, I found this one while we were looking around for a pizza stone, actually at the hardware store. So I know like, of course, a big box store like Lowe's will have this in the grilling section. Um, there's a company um, called Baking Steel. Um, they're on Instagram. They do a lot of great pizza demos and pizza parties, very similar concept. Um, you could also say at the hardware store, get some clay tiles and use those in a very similar way. But the company, hi Caroline, uh, is Lodge and they're about $35. All right, those first bagels are taking a minute to color. Probably going to take um, maybe another 10. So if we don't have any more questions. Um, there's a few more. Okay, um, there's a, somebody was asking about putting a bowl of water in the soap. Like when they're cooking the bagels, uh, can you put a bowl of water in the soap? You can. Um, I love that you're thinking about steaming the bagels. So yeah, if you just got your sheet pan or say you're just going to bake them on the pizza stone, you want to have a steamy environment, you can. I would use like a, um, a shallow pan, some water, some ice, and put that on the bottom rack and just let that steam happen in general in the oven rather than directly on the surface of the bagel with the board. Okay. Um, just got a couple more, uh, two or three more. Uh, okay, so when you do baguettes, they say to put a tray of wa with water and cloth below your bread. Can you do the same for bagel, for the bagels, if no bagel board? Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. And somebody was asking um, where you fa found your burlap at. Uh, they've never found a roll quite like that. Uh, truth be told, this is from Amazon. Uh, it's untreated craft burlap and it's um, three and a half. And if you look up uh, bagel boards on the internet, lo and behold, there's a million tutorials of how to make them super simple. Um, and it just directed me to a link 
you don't have to use Amazon if that's not for you, but there, I noticed there were a number of online um, sources to get this particular kind of burlap with. Um, and I think part of it is just, it's this tight, the tightness of the weave and it's untreated. Okay, I got two more. Um, there is, how long can you store freshly milled flour before you should use it? So I would, uh, I like to mill it right into my mixing bowl. That's just me. Like, let's keep it super fresh, but say, you know, say you've got a toddler and you need to like piece out your baking into different portions of the week. I freshly mill it, put it in um, a paper bag and then in a gallon Ziploc bag and keep it in the freezer for up to two weeks. Okay. And uh, the last question I have on here so far is, could you share more about fresh bagel toppings and what's your favorites? Uh, like once the bagel's cooked and everything like that, like what I like to put on it um, or the toppings, not because we could go. <laughs> I do love a topping in every direction. Um, yes, the- During baking. During the, I like sesame. I like sesame seed. Um, I do like everything, but sometimes it just like gets stuck in my, in my teeth too much. I love the flavor and the smallness and the crunchiness of a sesame seed. Um, other, you know, you could take any one of these ingredients from the everything topping and just simply do your bagel in any one of those, a minced garlic, a minced onion, a flaky salt. Um, per, if you're asking me personally, I kind of just prefer sesame seed and a plain bagel is always classic and beautiful as well. Um, I did experiment a little bit with sitar spice. So if you've got an interesting spice rack at home and you want to maybe try something out, that could be really fun. Um, but you are, just remember, you are going to get a mouthful of it. Um, I guess they were more or less like concerned about like, like more wet ingredients like sun-dried tomatoes or olives, st wet stuff to bake on top. Is that possible or recommended? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like put something on top of the bagel like that. I would put it in the dough. So if you want to, um, you want to add raisins or a bit of cinnamon, or you want to add olives or blueberries or whatever you want to put, uh, in your bagel dough. That's like, in my opinion, it's just seeds that should go on the outside. Something small, right? Because if you've got like a chunk of olive, it's just going to burn while the bagel is taking the time to bake. So something small, something tiny, um, bigger stuff goes in the dough, which is, that's great. Um, delicious. And I would just add it once you've gotten your dough all together into this beautiful dough ball, then you can keep it in the mixer and add the ingredient, like the raisins or the olives or the sun-dried tomatoes at the very end of the mixing. But I hope that answered your question a little better. But, yes. And well, Peter asked about cheese. In, I would do, well, you know, I guess I would get them to the point where they've steamed on the board or they're halfway through the bake, then put something like, you know, if you're going to do Parmesan or you want to do some Asiago on the top of the bagel, I would do that during the last maybe five minutes. You could probably also broil it for just a minute if you wanted that cheese to get crunchy. Just gonna check on these guys. Okay, and I think we're there. Okay, I hope you can see. So you want you want some color on your bagel. I've got a little golden. Oh, Sorry, guys. A little golden in the center. It's very hot. Um, ah! My bagel baby. Um, so I do have a little bit of color on the outside. It's nice and ruby red, but it's golden in the middle. And if I press on it, the whole thing is firm. So one way you can tell if it's done, like if you press on it, it still feels a little gummy. It's not ready. Um, so I'll try and get it in the light here for you. But you do want to see like a ruby color on the bagel. That's very important. You don't want it to be too pale. And um, I hope you can also tell like it's got some nice volume. 
So this was great proofing. Remember, it held the imprint of my finger, but slowly rose back to meet me. When I put it in the boiling water, it dipped down and then rose up, and we still got some great pop in the oven. It smells so good. I'm gonna retrieve the others. So the other ones looked great, but could just use a few more minutes. And you know, all these things are negotiable, which can feel to the new baker so overwhelming because you really do want to do it correctly and you want to repeat it again and again and again because so much of baking is just muscle memory. But um, I noticed that you know the bottom was coloring a little bit more than the top. So I just went ahead and flipped them over. So watch the first couple of times that you do this see what kind of adjustments um, you need to make, and then go ahead and make them. Baking is a, a very funny craft where you know, there are so many rules, and then once you do it long enough, you realize all the rules can bend, and um, you can really start having fun. So this is our sesame bagel, my favorite, just the sesame. Um, looks great, we've got nice lift, oven spring. Volume here, definitely not flat. Um, still has a nice shape to it, nicely colored. The bottom got a little dark, but nowhere near burnt. And you can see it's got that gorgeous shine and gloss and golden color to the bagel. So I'm ready to, Bust out the cream cheese, uh, a note on toppings. If we're gonna go there, <laughs> some of my favorite toppings on a bagel are um, raspberry jam on one side, cream cheese on the other, regular cream cheese, and then some lox, some capers, some red onion, a little bit of dill is basically my idea of heaven. So that's what we're gonna do with these later on today. But such a great thing as we're coming out of COVID, people are starting to gather again. Uh, you know, bagel brunches are really just like the best. So you can have a bagel potluck, get everybody to bring over a different kind of cream cheese. Other kinds of cream cheeses that I love is a scallion cream cheese or a strawberry cream cheese. You wanna get your cream cheese to room temperature, you're gonna put it in a food processor and whip it up and then sprinkle your ingredients and again, whip it up so it's just nice and spreadable. Um, you can do some mascarpone, really. The toppings are endless, of course. We're not even gonna get it into like pizza bagels, which I feel like I'll be making soon enough for my child and myself, to be honest. So really, once you made the bagel, then there's a whole other exploration of the toppings and what tastes best. Do you want to let these beautiful bagels cool um, as long as you can stand it um, because they are going to be difficult to cut. So you do want, um, there's been a lot of emergency visits when people are cutting bagels, especially with a new sharp knife. You do want something serrated here and relatively sharp because it is tough. And so these are also great, uh, something like a welding glove because you can go ahead and cut, um, you know, cut the bagel, boom, like so. Um, the gluten is still setting. So whether it's a bagel or your bread dough, um, it's literally still baking after it comes out of the oven for probably in the next 20 minutes. Um, and you really won't taste um, the true flavor until so i got i got a little air bubble over here but this looks good to me this is still hot and it will look a little gummy if it's uh not fully cooled same thing for your loaf of bread however it is my personal belief that um hot bread should be shared between friends and so i do always like to cut it open 
and just take a little bite and see. Mm. Yep, it's good. <laughs> super crisp crust, super crunchy. Like, I know that the mic isn't that good, but there is a lot of crunch going on there. So nicely baked on the outside, tender on the inside. The sourdough is giving it some gorgeous tang. That addition of the spelt flour just kind of grounds the white flour, gives it some personality, some toothiness. And yeah, we're ready for some cream cheese and lox here. So um, we can take any last questions. And I do hope that um, your bagel adventures go well for you at home. And send me pictures, send me emails. I'd love to hear from folks. And um, yeah. What do you think of pepper jelly on your uh, bagel? Oh, yeah. Love pepper jelly. Love it. Was that you? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, I love pepper jelly. Pepper jelly is so good. Anything on a bagel. I mean, yeah, it's like a, I would love to just have, right, like a whole bar of toppings. Such a great thing to do. As I mentioned, you know, we just had our first kind of small gathering here at the studio since COVID happened last year. And it feels nice to be moving out into our social circles. But yeah, a table full of bagels, table full of toppings, pepper jelly, jam, cream cheese, whatever you want. Um, your day, your way. Hey, guys. All right, uh, unless we have any other questions, I think that um, might be time to get on with our Saturday here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I love to hear from folks. I'm a broken record, can't say it enough. Please send me pictures. Please send me an email. I'm happy to repost on Instagram. If this is the first time that we're meeting, it's nice to meet you. Um, I do baking classes and instruction in person and virtually. I'm also an author. So you can find more of my ramblings on bread and life. This is my first book called The Baker's Year. You can get it wherever books are sold. You can also purchase it directly from my website. I also have Dehydrated Sourdough Starter for sale on my website as well, where you signed up for this class. Um, and I'm working on my second book called Sour Flower that's due out by Potter in August of 2022. And it's all about bread. It's 101 sourdough bread recipes from whole grain flours, fried flours, white flour, you name it. And I uh, really just love baking. And I thank you for taking your time to join me this morning. Do we have any questions? I have to stare over there to see your gorgeous faces. Uh, it looks like that's it. All right, everybody. Um, we're going to turn the camera off so I can like make my food faces alone. Thank you so much. Uh, keep in touch and have a great weekend. Bye.